Let's go. Let's go. I agree. Ready to improve we are. Ready to improve we are. It's a bit of a tongue twister. Believe it or not, people just started working above my head in the apartment above me about three minutes ago. Why? I don't know. Maybe they knew I had to do a webinar. So they are banging a decent amount. Hopefully it does not cause us too many issues. I will do my best to completely talk over them. <laughs> they start banging. I've learned if I just talk and talk and talk and talk, I can talk through it. And then you all can't hear the banging. Only me. Today, we are going to be discussing playing the turn in live cash games. This is actually part of my new, completely updated, gigantic tournament. I'm sorry, cash game masterclass. When's the cash game masterclass coming out? I literally finished the recordings today. We have to go through, we have to add a bunch of um, quizzes. As you all know, my t tournament masterclass has a bunch of quizzes between every video. The cash game masterclass is pretty big. The post flop section alone is over 100 short videos. It's a lot of work. It's for serious poker players, but it tells you everything you need to know to smash the cash games. So you just started studying Secrets of Professional Tournament Poker, The Essential Guide. Where is that? Where is that? Here it is. Check it out. Secrets of Professional Tournament Poker, The Essential Guide. Big, solid, hardcover book. Lots of images. Lots of uh, text, etc., etc. To be fair, I will say that the goal is not necessarily a lot of content. The goal is actually the minimum amount of content you need to be very, very good right? And I do my absolute best to give you everything you need with the minimum amount of content. You know what? Funny enough, I have the wrong overlay up here. This is not going to go well, I can tell. Let's see. Where is my... Nope, that's not what we need. That's what we need. There we go. There we go. Let's rearrange all this. By the way, we have to have this finished by, well, an hour from now because we have a poker coaching webinar starting right here on YouTube if you're a poker coaching member. It'll be a private link. Make sure you get into pokercoaching.com. All right. Neighbors upstairs are banging. Yeah, they're banging. They're banging really hard upstairs. They're, they're having a good time. All right. Let's discuss playing the turn in live cash games. And today, we're going to be discussing specifically, specifically, very specifically, when to continuation bet the turn. It's very important that you use proper terms, very concise terms, so that you're fully aware of what you're actually talking about. So many people make the blunder of thinking that poker is the same when it goes check, bet, call on the flop compared to check, check on the flop. And... It's not. You have to realize that when it goes check, check on the flop, the flop or the pre-flop raise through check behinds range is often relatively condensed and usually lacks the nuts. But whenever the player continuation bets the flop, their range should generally be either very polarized on boards that are not so good for them or they're betting with almost everything. It's important to note, though, that when the player calls a flop continuation bet, what happens to their range? Take a second, think about it. When someone calls your flop continuation bet, what happens to their range? Well, they lose all of their garbage. When your opponent calls your flop bet, they don't have anything, which makes ranges get way, way closer, right? All right, so what is a turn continuation bet? A turn continuation bet is very specifically when the flop aggressor continues betting on the turn. And typically, like I said, equities are going to be closer. Quite often, the flop continuation bet is still going to have a nut advantage, but they're, uh, they're, they're going to have a nut advantage, but they're going to lack the range advantage. Okay? So whenever that's the case, whenever you have the nut advantage, but lack the range advantage to some extent, usually it's not awful, but sometimes it is, in that scenario, you're going to be betting very polarized. You're no longer going to bet everything on the turn. So you need to consider how the turn card specifically interacts with your range and your opponent's range to figure out if it increases your equity, is neutral, or decreases your equity, and also if it gives you a lot of nut hands in your range. So we'll discuss how to play on various types of turn cards, like over cards, draw completing cards, 
cards that pair the board and complete blanks. So we're going to go through these three scenarios. So let's discuss good cards for the flop continuation better. Sometimes, although not that often, you will frequently continue betting your entire range or almost your entire range on the turn when the turn increases your equity, which, like I said, does not actually happen all that often. The main time this happens is when the turn card brings an over card or a card that gives you a whole lot of nut, a nut hands. So, for example, let's say the board comes king, eight, four. Your opponent's going to check. Let's say they're in the big blind. You continuation bet. They call. They probably don't have a whole lot of ace high here. They probably have a whole lot of kings and eights and fours, right? But you would bet the flop with a whole lot of your ace highs. So since you would bet the flop with a whole lot of your ace highs, when the turn comes an ace, that gives you a whole lot of very strong hands, which is going to result in you betting very frequently. Also, say it's low cards and the turn is a big card, like an ace, king, queen, jack. Those are very, very good cards for the flop continuation better because all of their bluffs are hands like queen, jack, jack, 10, king, jack, ace high, right? And that's going to be very, very good for them. Just realize, I'm just doing everything wrong today. We're not having a fall sale today. We're having a Halloween sale today. There you go. Pokercoaching.com slash Halloween. Fall sale ended. All right. What else am I doing wrong? Am I doing anything else wrong today? If I'm doing anything else wrong today. Let me know. All right. So in scenarios where you get a good turn card, when your equity increases, you're going to usually be betting very often, usually with a small size, because essentially you're just putting money in the pot with all, your entire range as a bit of a favorite. Also, sometimes the turn is going to give you a large nut advantage. Like say you raise early position, big blind calls, it comes ace, queen, 10, jack. In that scenario, whatever bluffs you have on the flop are going to be king highs, right? And so in this scenario, you're going to have a whole lot of straights, and that allows you to continue betting frequently. Again, this does not happen all that often. Neutral cards. Whenever you get a neutral card, you're going to mix continuation betting and checking, usually betting reasonably polarized, betting with your best hands and your draws, although sometimes a little bit wider than that. Some of your um, you know, decently strong marginal made hands like top pair, no kicker can keep betting on some of these turns. Um, so this is a spot where you will keep betting some portion of the time. So usually this is going to be when the top card pairs on a low board. So think about it, right? Let's say you raise from middle position, the big blind calls, it comes 9, 7, 5. They check, you bet the flop. In the spot when you bet the flop, you're going to have a whole lot of 9s in your range, right? Also, you're still going to have your over pairs in your range. So when they check the turn, you can continuation bet this turn Polarized, right? Usually with a lot of nines, but also with a lot of eights and sixes, right? Um, also, whenever the board does, it just doesn't change all that often, right? When it does not change the flop nuts well, on a board like king, king, six, ten, right? The ten is relevant, and if you think about it, it actually completes a lot of your bluffs. A lot of your bluffs are going to be queen, ten, jack, ten, ten, nine type hands on this flop. So whenever you make a pair, you also get to keep betting some portion of the time if you feel inclined. And whenever the river or the turn card is a complete blank that does not change the nuts on the flop again, like ace jack five two, you can again keep betting. If you all like this content, well, uh, you're gonna love the cash game masterclass that's coming out in late November. If you're a poker coaching premium member, it's just included, no extra charge. We also have a tournament masterclass that is you know similar enough to this, except for the tournament masterclass mostly discusses shallower stacked play, whereas the cash game masterclass discusses deeper stacked play. What about when you get a bad turn card? Now, you're going to be checking very, very frequently. When the turn is not good for you, you must do a lot of checking. And this is usually going to be when the middle or bottom card pairs, because you will often not continuation bet middle pair or bottom pair on the flop, but your opponent will very often check and call with it, right? So in that scenario, you're going to be checking back a lot because the risk of getting check raised is just too high. And if your opponent can reasonably polarize their range that turns all of your uh, marginal made hands into bluff catchers, it's not a great spot. Like imagine you have ace-king on king-9-5-5, five, five, right? You bet the flop, your opponent calls, you get the turn, turns to five, your opponent checks. If you bet again and they check raise you, you have a bluff catcher. In this scenario, their range is going to be random draws and fives, 
right? And against random draws and fives, ace-king is not in, a, in all that great of shape, right? So you want to be checking a ton in this scenario if your opponent's anywhere near competent. It is worth noting, if your opponent's not competent and they will literally only check raise a turn with a five on king nine five five, well then your life's really easy. You can just bet and then fold if they raise. You gotta realize, poker is actually not all that difficult of a game if your opponents are going to make blunders left and right. And some of your opponents will make blunders left and right. And in that scenario, good. Just figure out what they do wrong and then take advantage of it. It's not all that hard. But when you're playing against players who play well and structure their ranges intelligently, as you will when you start playing medium and high stakes cash games, you must make sure that you are also in turn playing fundamentally sound. Also, bad turns are turns that complete a lot of your opponent's obvious draws. These are usually going to be low cards that make a four straight. Because if you raise, let's say, under the gun and the big blind calls when it comes... 7, 5, 3, 4, you have almost no 6s in your range, but your opponent does have 6s in their range, right? So when they have a lot of 6s, you in turn have to do a whole lot of checking. Okay? So understand that the turn card... When, when the turn card gives you a range advantage, it's sort of like a power-up that lets you continue betting frequently. So on good turns, you keep betting with basically everything. On neutral turns, you mix premium hands and draws but still betting frequently, and on bad turns, you do a whole lot of checking, and when you do bet, you're betting with your premium hands and your draws. And also, in general, you should check a lot more often from out of position, because when you check, you can still face two streets of aggression, or if you bet, your opponent can raise and re-raise, right? Whereas when you're in position and you bet and your opponent calls, you get to decide if you want to put in any money on the river. So, in general, from out of position, in cash games, you must do a whole lot. I'm sorry, out of position, you must do a whole lot of checking. In position, you get to do a decent amount more betting. Okay? So, which hands are we going to be checking with compared to the flop? And in general, you're going to find that you bluff less often on the turn than on the flop. If you've studied the homework at PokerCoaching.com, you know that on the flop, at most, you can have two draws to every one premium made hand in your range, and fewer is fine, so it can be like a one-to-one -one ratio. On the turn, though, the most draws you can have in your range is something like a one-to-one -one ratio, which means some of your draws are going to need to check on the turn, right? So you're typically only going to continue barreling on the turn with your best draws, that have pretty good equity, ideally ones that can call raises, or just like pretty bad hands that are very, very weak draws. And the purpose for this is so that you do not bet the turn and then get raised, right? Getting raised is, is quite terrible. And also, you just can't get away with bluffing too often. Very often on the flop, it's pretty easy to have 65% of your betting range being effective draws. And if you bet all of them on the turn, you're going to be drastically over bluffing. So, an example of a spot where you may want to check is when you bet the flop with, let's say, a gut shot, like a gut shot with an overcard. But the turn is a neutral card that brings a backdoor flush draw that your opponent could easily have. This is a spot where if you bet, yeah, you can get your opponent to fold, but at the same time, it's, it's just not a great spot to bet because you have lots of better draws to bet, right? You have to be careful to not overbluff against people who are good. So the solution is to check with draws that are not good enough to call if your opponent raises. And that's usually going to be 8-out draws, 9-out draws, like flush draws, straight draws that are not drawing to additional equity. What do you mean when you say a draw? A draw is a hand that is likely not good at the moment, but has equity to improve. Depending on the board, it can be a flush draw, a straight draw, a straight flush draw, Bottom pair that check raise the flop, which you should be doing when you're playing deep stacked some portion of the time. Um, on un uncoordinated boards, it becomes hands like backdoor flush draws and backdoor straight draws, like on king 8 2. What's a draw on king 8 2? Well, 10 9 with a backdoor flush draw is a pretty reasonable hand. Or ace 3 on 10 8 2 with a backdoor flush draw is a pretty reasonable hand to be bluffing. Because if you get there on the turn with a pair, you're pretty happy. And if you pick up a flush draw or straight draw on the turn, you're also pretty happy. So let's take a look at the turn frequency sizing and flow chart for continuation betting. In the Cash Game Masterclass that's coming out, there's the giant section on when you're facing a bet, when you bet and get raised, when you um, when it goes check, check on the flop when we're in this scenario, et cetera, et cetera. All the spots you'll encounter are included in that course that will be coming out in late November. So what does this show? First things first, let's start over here. 
Our frequency, how often we are betting, is determined by how good the turn card is for us. If it's a good turn card, we're going to be betting pretty often, usually 60% of the time or more, often using a small size. On the neutral turn cards, we're going to be betting between 40 and 60% of the time, pretty polarized. And on bad turn cards, we're going to be betting very infrequently, usually extremely polarized. Okay? And when I say polarized, I mean you're betting with your absolute best made hands that are happy getting a lot of money in, your high equity draws that are not folding, straight flush draws, stuff like that, nut flush draws, etc. Um, and then you're going to be betting with some just absolute garbage that can easily bet and then fold. That way your opponent doesn't know if you have a really good made hand, a really good draw, or some junk. So once you decide you're going to bet, the question becomes then, do you have the nut advantage? If you have a lot of nut hands in your range, and your opponent does not, in that scenario, you'd go over here to yes, okay? Then you want to ask, how well does the opponent's range connect with the board? Meaning, do they have a lot of hands that are, like, obviously strong? If your opponent has a lot of hands that are obviously strong, they can stick around, you usually want to be betting quite big. If they do not, like, say the board's king eight to six, right? In that scenario, maybe you want to be betting smaller. That said, on the turn, because you bet the flop and your opponent called, Usually your opponent has a pretty reasonable range, and for that reason, like whatever they got to the turn with is going to connect well enough with the board, right? It's going to be a lot of hands like pairs and whatnot. So typically when you bet the flop and your opponent calls, when you're betting again on the turn, especially on neutral turns and bad cards, you're betting with hands that have a, like you're betting your nut advantage portion of your range, and usually your opponent's going to have something decent, so usually you're betting large. If you do not have the nut advantage, which very often you will not on these cards that increase your equity, you're usually going to be betting small. For example, on 975 Jack, right? This is a turn card that gives you a lot of top pairs because you'd continuation bet King Jack, Queen Jack, Jack 10. It also gives you, you know, some pretty good hands like two pairs. You still have over pairs in your range, right? These are all hands that are very happy betting here. So you have a solid range advantage, but you do not have a nut advantage here when you open from, let's say, under the gun. Because if you raise under the gun and the big blind calls, or you raise under the gun and the button calls, they're going to have hands like 10-8 suited and 10-8 off suit even, right? 9-7 suited. Pocket fives, which maybe you don't even play. Jack-9 suited, etc. So you see that this is a spot where you, you are betting frequently because you have a range advantage, but you do not have the nut advantage. So when you do bet this turn, you're going to be using a smaller size, most likely. Is this for tournaments or cash games? Well, it's for deep stack poker in general at the moment, but it definitely applies to cash games. This is straight from my upcoming cash game masterclass. You want to go through some examples? Or should we pack it up? Let me know what you want to do. We can go through them. We can not go through them. Whatever you all want to do. I'm here for all of you. It's important to realize, though, big, big, big main point. Whenever you get a good turn, you're betting frequently. When you get a neutral turn, you're betting in a medium amount, kind of polarized. And when you get a bad turn, you do a whole lot of checking. All right, let's go through an example. Let's say you raise a low jack, big blind calls, 100 big blinds deep, okay? Flop comes ace jack, five, two spades. Big blind checks, low jack bets 33% pot as they will do decently often. Big blind calls, fine. When you bet the flop, and the opponent calls, this is how much equity you have on all turn cards, all possible turn cards, okay? Notice that you are roughly 50-50 in this spot on basically all cards, except for the king, queen, and 10, and even then it's not like you have a giant range advantage in these scenarios. You cannot have five of spades, jack of hearts, or ace of spades on the turn because they're on the board, right? So this is a spot where I can already tell you we're not going to be betting all that often on the turn because we don't have all that much equity. We just can't have all that much equity in this scenario, right? Because um, when we bet the flop, we have a lot of marginal stuff, and the opponent's going to have a whole lot of aces or jacks or flush draws, right? How do you know if the turn is neutral or good? Well, you study. You study away from the table. Right here, we have this chart. In this scenario, none of these turns are especially amazing. In the... Um, Cash Game Masterclass, I go through, gosh, I don't know, <laughs> 100 of these, 50 of these, a whole lot of them, where we go through how to play all sorts of spots and all sorts of scenarios. There will be some spots where the turn gives you like 60% equity at most, but um, not all that often. So when that's the case, 
this image here shows you how often you're going to be betting and what size you're going to be betting, okay? So notice, on basically every turn, besides the ace, you're using pretty big sizes. And when I say a big size, I mean 120% pot, over pot. So this is something a lot of people do not do in cash games, and it's a big mistake. If you raise from the low jack, the big blind calls, flop comes, ace jack five, they check, you bet a third pot, your opponent calls. On the turn, when it's a two of clubs, when you decide to bet, you should be betting 120% pot, maybe even more. You should be over betting. Why? Because your aces smash your opponent's aces, right? On the bigger turn cards, you're usually going to be using a medium or a small size in general. And that's because like on the turn ace, your opponent's just in pretty miserable shape because your aces, like I said, beat their aces, right? Um, and you get to bet decently often, even though your range advantage is actually not all that high. It's kind of a weird spot. But the king, queen, and 10 are very common scenarios you see where you're betting more, uh, more often in general. Like you see the king is one of the best cards for you and you're betting pretty often. Um, but when you do, you're betting using a two-thirds pot or overbet size again. Kind of interesting to see that the hearts are bet a little bit less often in general than the diamonds and clubs. But that's because that brings backdoor flush draws, which will give your opponent more hands to check raise you with, right? And so you're going to be wanting to bet those in general a little bit less often. And you see the spades, you actually don't bet very often at all, right? And the reason you're not betting the spades all that often is because if you think about your range, your range doesn't actually contain all that many flushes when the ace of spades is on the board. Because when you raise from low jack, you're not raising like 9-6 suited, right? But your opponent will defend the big blind with 9-6 suited. So they have a lot of flushes and you do not. So in that scenario, you still are in okay shape from a range advantage point of view. But you, again, generally lack, you don't necessarily even lack the nut advantage, but when you're betting, you're betting with flushes and flush draws for the most part, plus a few nonsense bluffs. It is worth noting the high flush cards are actually quite bad for you. The king, queen, and 10 are pretty bad. You see you're betting very, very infrequently, right? And the reason for that is because when the king of spades comes, think about your early position range. Well, I'm about to show it to you. It's all... Ace X and King X suited, plus a few other hands, right? So when the Ace and the King are on the board, you don't have very many flushes in your range at all, which forces you to check very frequently, right? Okay, let's go through how to play this from an implementable point of view and then compare it to the GTO strategy. I always like showing this implementable point of view where you do not mix your frequencies at all, meaning you're not betting any hand a small portion of the time and checking it some different portion of the time. Although, to be fair, playing deep stack, you really do need to be mixing up your strategy. So let's take a look at how you'd play a range in this spot. Uh, right off the bat, notice you're not betting everything on the flop. On the flop, if you had ace nine suited, check it back. It's a hand that can easily let it go check, check, call a turn bet, call a river bet. Life's easy, right? So you would check back all these weak aces, check back hands like kings and queens, check back king jack, check back queen jack. So when you bet the flop, your flop range is going to be aces, ace king, ace queen, ace jack, ace ten, all these hands that are not in white. The white hands are no longer in our range because from an implementable point of view, we would have played them differently, right? So when we get to the turn in this scenario, this is what our range looks like. And what you want to do is you want to go through and just categorize your range into premium made hands, draws, marginal made hands, and junk. What does I tell you? What do I tell you to do with your marginal made hands? Check! In this scenario, you want to be checking with your marginal made hands and you want to be checking your junk. So what is a marginal made hand? A marginal made hand is a hand that if you bet and get raised, you're very unhappy, but it's a hand that has pretty good equity. And usually that's going to be something like top pair, second kicker, and worse, down to something like maybe bottom pair or whatnot if you have it. In this scenario, notice that we don't actually have a whole lot of bottom pair type hands because we're raising with a tight range from the low jack seat to begin with. So in this scenario, our marginal made hands are all ace queen and ace 10, and that's it. So like a pretty, pretty good marginal made hand range, right? But you don't want to bet ace-10 and get raised. That would be miserable. So we're betting the hands that we're happy not folding, which are going to be ace-king and better, right? And then we're betting with some draws. So what are draws on this board? Obviously, flush draws are pretty good. Also, king-queen and queen-10. In this scenario, we actually have a pretty large amount of premium made hands, 38%. So remember what I said. You can have one draw to every one made hand on the turn. So we could have at most 38%, but usually a little bit fewer is ideal. And right here we have 27% draws, 38% premium made hands, okay? Which I think is fine. 
You also ideally want your marginal made range to junk to be about a 70-30 ratio, which is roughly what we have here. That way, when your opponent bets the river, you can call pretty often. Our junk, by the way, is going to be like random backdoor cards here with hearts that we are just checking and giving up. I know they're not visible on this image. So that's what we're doing in this spot, and I think this works out pretty nicely. Notice that, um, by the way, we're checking 35-ish percent of the time. GTO strategy checks a little bit more, 42%. Ideally, you want your flop strategy or your turn strategy to line up pretty well with the GTO strategy. Um, that said, as the solver uses more and more mixed strategies, you will just naturally get away from, from that. So your, your strategy won't line up quite as well. Notice that uh, we are... So we were, check, we were betting a little bit more often than the GTO strategy, which I think is fine in general as an exploit and for the most part. Take a look at what GTO is betting. GTO bets um, basically ace, queen, and better, right? Notice ace, 10, ace, 9, ace, 8, ace, 7, all check. Because if you bet and get raised, it's really, really bad, right? Um, then what are we bluffing? Kind of neat to see hands like 8s and 7s bluffing some portion of the time. Cool to see. 5-4, bluffing with bottom pair some portion of the time. And a lot of these here are going to be flush draws, right? Like 10-9 is a, a flush draw in this scenario. Interesting to see Jack-10 betting. I, I have to presume this is going to be Jack-10 with the flush draw as well. Then we see King-Queen offsuit, like I said, betting a lot. If you bet King-Queen offsuit and get raised, you fold, right? Life's nice and easy. The good thing about betting big, though, is that usually your opponent should not respond with a raise. Obviously, in this masterclass, I go through and explain how to play when you are in this scenario and you face a bet and how to respond to a raise. But this is a spot where when you bet the King-Queen, usually you get to see the river, which also gives you some pretty good bluffing spots. What does GTO stand for? Game Theory Optimal. This is a strategy you can use, and it does not matter what your opponent does. You will either break even or you will win. When you're playing against good players, you want to play a strategy that is very difficult to play against. Otherwise, it's going to be super easy to play against, right? Like what a lot of people do wrong on the turn is they just always bet with the nuts, right? Or they always bet with bluffs, whatever. Most people just only bet with the nuts, and that's just awful, unless your opponents are extreme calling stations and don't know what they're doing, right? Obviously, though, you should clearly adjust whatever your opponents do wrong, especially in small stakes games if your opponents are playing poorly. I said this at the top of the show for all those who are late. If your opponents play poorly, poker becomes very, very easy. It's not a difficult game whatsoever if you know your opponent, let's say, always calls with bottom pair, right? If your opponent always calls with bottom pair, then... Clearly value bet everything like middle pair and better. Life's easy. But if your opponent's going to play reasonably well, you can't get away with value betting stuff like middle pair with no flush draw because you're wide open to getting smashed. Also, if your opponent always check raises on the flop with top pair, it means they don't have it, right? But again, you got to presume your opponents aren't completely oblivious to how to play poker, especially once you move up in stakes. Okay? It's very, very important to know roughly what the GTO strategy looks like so you can then adjust from it to take advantage of whatever your opponent's doing correctly, right? For example, think, imagine if you think your opponent's a little bit of a calling station. Not much of a calling station, but a little bit of a calling station. Well, maybe you want to be value betting like ace-queen and ace-10 in this scenario. But you probably shouldn't be value betting the ace-3, right? But if you looked at the GTO solver and it turned out you're supposed to be value betting like ace-7, then maybe betting ace-3 is actually well within reason, Right? So it's important to know roughly what the GTO strategy looks like so that you can adjust accordingly, right? Like if you want to adjust a ton, what does a ton mean here? Does a ton mean value betting pocket tens? Well, probably not, right? Because you see pocket tens is like nowhere near being bet and queens is nowhere near being bet, right? So these are hands that would basically never bet unless your opponent is like the most extreme calling station in the world. So you see that you need to know roughly what GTO looks like so you know where to adjust to. And from, also, if you're making adjustments exploitatively against the player pool, you want to make sure that you know where to adjust back to if your adjustments seem to not be working against your particular opponents. All right, what about a turn 10? Ooh, 10 of spades, nasty card. We're going to be doing a lot of checking here. Why are we doing a lot of checking? Because we don't actually have all that many flushes in our range. Take a look at our range here. We have only king 9 suited, king 8 suited, king 7 suited, king 6 suited, and 10 9 suited in our range that are flushes. We actually have, let's see, we have, I think we have these two as well that are flushes. Perhaps we're checking those though. Um, you should, actually we can't have these obviously, the ten of spades is on the board, I'm a fish. We have us checking the king, queen of spades, whatever, I think that's fine and good. But this is a spot where if you 
don't study GTO, you may not know what to do with a hand like ace-king or ace-queen in the spot. Is ace-queen a check or is it a bet? What about um, ace-jack? Is that a check or a bet? It's a tough spot, right? You may be surprised to see from a GTO point of view, I, I have to imagine ace-10 and ace-jack are going to check a lot in this spot. Because if you bet and get raised, it's miserably bad. And while you do have a few flushes in your range, you don't actually have all that many. When you are betting here with this ace-king and king-queen, this is when you have a spade, right? So this is um, not really a draw. It's, it's a hand you can bet and then call a raise with, right? So that is definitely worth noting. We're betting sets. You can bet sets and call a raise with them, right? And then you're checking a lot of the ace-x, right? Also even checking king-queen some portion of the time, I think. Because, again, you have to ask, if I bet and get raised, am I happy? To some extent, you may call a hand like ace-king a spade a draw here, but it's not really a draw. So at this point, the actual classification of the hand is not all that important. You have to realize, like, you're betting with the idea that if you bet and get raised, you're still sticking around. Okay? So notice we are checking about 63% of the time. GTO checks about 60% of the time, which is good. You always want to make sure whenever you're developing a strategy that it lines up somewhere near GTO. If you're way far off, it either means you have no clue what you're doing, or it means you are trying to exploit particular player pool tendencies. So what is GTO doing here? GTO is, well, take a look at King-Queen doing a lot of checking. Take a look at Ace-Queen entirely checking. Ace-Jack and Ace-10 mostly checking, right? Sets are mostly betting. Flushes are mostly betting. That's all these hands in here. Um... Queen 10, kind of a cool to see Queen 10 suited if you have it as going for a bluff a lot of the time. Pretty neat. Also, pretty cool to see 7s and 6s going for a bluff some portion of the time when you have the spade, right? These are hands that are almost certainly not good, but if you bet and get called, they still have a little bit of equity when you peel a spade, right? Notice, though, I did not have those in my range because we would have checked them on the flop the majority of the time. So they're not in my range, which means we have to find different bluffs, right? It's important to realize that you can't just look straight at the solver and say, this is what I would do, because like some of you are saying in the chat, no human can play like a solver, which I agree, right? So you have to figure out implementable strategies that are close enough. And if you take a look at the solver and all the bluffs that the solver uses are not in your range, you can't just say, okay, those aren't in my range, therefore I don't bluff any. That's not how it works. It's absolutely not how it works. So make sure that you are adjusting your range appropriately. Okay? Ooh, Thursday, God's Big Toe office hours. Make sure you get in there. God's Big Toe has been in the Discord helping all the students improve, so make sure you check that out. Also, we have study sessions with Louis Philippe. Make sure you get in there. So anyway, this is one, one example from the Cash Game Masterclass that's coming out. Someone said earlier, good thing it's getting easier. <laughs> I think it was a joke because like, look, poker's kind of hard. I hate to break it to you. Poker is kind of difficult at a high level. You actually have to work hard and you have to study. And like I learned a lot making this gigantic cash game masterclass for 100 big blind and 200 big blind poker. Um, a good example, I'll tell you about a spot. Say you raise low jack seat and the button calls. Okay? Flop comes king, king, six. What should you do in that scenario with your entire range? How often should you bet? How often should you check on king, king, six out of position 100 big blinds deep? And what size should you use? Big question, huh? Well, 100 big blinds deep, you should bet with your entire range big. Two-thirds pot. Maybe even a touch bigger. Okay, fine. What about 200 big blinds deep out of position? What should you do? Take a second. Think about it. I didn't know. I would have got it wrong. If you gave me that one data point, king, king, six, out of position, bet, two-thirds pot 100% of the time, surprising to me what you should do um, 200 big blinds deep. You should actually check about 45% of the time. And when you bet, you should be betting mostly small, mostly a third pot just because you're a little bit deeper stacked. Cool stuff, right? I didn't know that. I would have bet too often in that scenario. I would have used a big bet size too often in that scenario. But going through the solver, studying these things, you learn how to play better poker. And like a lot of people who um, try to poo-poo on GTO don't realize that like you find a lot of insightful things like this that are very valuable. 
Um, and something else a lot of people don't do is they don't just find like the sporadic king high and queen high bluffs, like king three on various boards, where you have plenty of logical draws, but you know, you're sitting here with some random king high and queen high. Turns out those hands go for bluffs some portion of the time. And a lot of people never do it. And you would never even think to do it unless you were studying the GTO. It's important to study GTO because that will let you know how to just play better. Find the hands that you should be betting more often than not. We're having Halloween sale now. I'll tell you about the Halloween sale for just a minute. I have a poker training site. Did you all know I have a poker training site? If you're a member, let me know. By the way, if you're a member, we have hats in. Hats and patches. Send us an email, support at pokercoaching.com, and we will do our best to get those for you. In Poker Coaching Premium, we have my Tournament Masterclass. It's over 30 hours long, where I go through all sorts of scenarios, kind of like we did today. Woke like Jesus said, you just signed up today. Awesome. Glad to hear it. This cash game, or Tournament Masterclass is not for sale. When I have my Cash Game Masterclass coming out soon, it will not be for sale either. And it is just part of Poker Coaching Premium. So make sure you get in on that. Also, we have a 30-day tournament preparation challenge where every day, if you opt into this, I will email you something to do every day. Just a little something to study to help you improve your poker skills. Going through this active learning process is going to go a long way to helping you improve your poker skills, but also your life skills. Getting good at having good habits. It's like getting in the mindset of, I'm going to spend a little bit of time every day improving my skills is very, very, very important. And, and this applies to everything, right? Like if you want to get in good shape, you should perhaps, um, you know, get in the gym frequently, right? And eat right frequently. If you want to get good at poker, you should study a decent amount. You should also, you know, put in a lot of volume. If you're not a tournament player, we also have a 30-day cash game challenge where, again, every day I will send you emails. My kids are screaming outside. They don't like cash games, I guess. Sending you emails, giving you something to study every day. If that's not enough, we also have over 1,400 interactive quizzes where me and my team of pros help you learn how to play poker. Cough, cough, JL. Yeah, the kids are screaming. Sorry. Is the website not working? If the website's not working, let me know. You know how it goes. Let's see. Let's see if the website's not working. Probably isn't. Did I spell Halloween wrong? No, it seems to be working. Okay, it's working. Yeah, John, o John o Lantern over here is giving deals. Pokercoaching.com slash Halloween. Maybe the link we have on YouTube is not working. Who knows? So anyway, we have over 1,400 interactive quizzes where me and my team of pros go through hands that we played and tell you how we played this spot. Now, the way we played this spot may ne not necessarily be ideal. We work hard, we learn, we study, Right? And also, in these scenarios, we're going through a lot of exploitative plays. Some people say, well, you're not playing GTO because GTO is very often not the optimal thing if you know what your opponent does incorrectly, right? It's important to make sure that you are aware of what your opponent's doing correctly. And these quizzes, over 1,400 of them, go a long way to helping you how learn how to play exploitative poker, Right? How much do the poker coaching quizzes diverge from DTO, GTO play? It depends on the quiz, right? Whenever I'm going through quizzes where I'm playing high stakes tournaments against really good opponents, I'm playing pretty close to GTO. Whenever I'm playing a $500 tournament or 2-5 no limit, like you see some of these quizzes here, $300 tournament, in those scenarios, we're going to be playing very exploitative for the most part, right? Because typically as you play smaller and smaller stakes games, your opponents play worse and worse. All right? It's hard to understand why people are watching but not liking. Why would you watch this if you're not liking it? Well, look, everybody doesn't like the content. That's okay. Speaking of liking things, I apparently don't like money. So far, I've spent over half a million dollars hiring my world-class team of coaches to create content for you inside of Poker Coaching Premium. Here they all are. If you see them at the World Series, say hello. One of my favorite coaches here. We have him highlighted. Burt Stevens, Draft Ganger. He was the number one player in the world as of earlier this year. He absolutely smashes it. He gets in there. He battles hard. And he streams, not on Twitch, not for everybody to see, but privately for poker coaching premium students to see only. It results in there being something like 50 or 100 people in his streams. And whenever you have a small group of people there, people there who are actively trying to learn, and he's not overwhelmed with the chat of 1,000 people on Twitch, he actually gets to go in and 
get very good analysis of why he does what he does. And you want an exploitative player playing the highest stakes, there he is. Because uh, he plays a, an interesting adjusted GTO strategy that is very, very exploitative. It's fun to watch, and I've learned a ton from it. I mean, look, I, I could go through and outline all of these people. Um, look them all up. They're all good, strong, world-class poker players. Here's Jonathan Jaffe. I did a webinar with him just the other day. We played a bunch of hands together in a $10,000 tournament, I think, recently at the Poker Masters. And um, he gets in there. He battles hard. He is a very, very, very strong player who knows GTO very well and also exploits very well. And uh, like Jay Fleming says here, he's been crushing the World Series. I think he has a third and a fourth or something like that so far. That's a lot of fun. All right. Let's take a look at what, what some of the students are doing. This, this slide gets updated all the time, so I don't actually know what it says. Here we have Max Tave. Max Tave, I know him. He's always talking to me on Instagram. He took third place. Nice, sick, Max. What in the world did you win? Third place in the reunion. Ooh, this was the uh, $500 buy-in tournament with 12,000 players. They're almost 13,000 players. Solid, solid. Third place for 241000 bucks. Good job, good work. Good job, good work. It's always good to win uh, 250k in a $500 tournament. Shout out to him. Good job. Sweet. All right. Here's the price of Poker Coaching Premium. We normally charge $99 per month, but if you want to sign up for three months or a year or two years or three years, you get a big discount. I know that a lot of people have been, um, I guess, rugged, rug pulled by people in the content creation space where they say they're going to be in the content creation space for a while and they sell you something expensive and then they disappear. They fall off of the internet. I'm not going to do that. I will be here for at least three years. I'll be here for many, many more years, okay? I'll be here for many, many more years continuing to help all of my students improve their poker skills. I love it. I like helping all of you enjoy poker more because I, at one point in my career a long time ago, was a struggling poker player and I realized that that is frustrating. And I want to help all of you not be struggling, frustrated poker players, right? I also love hearing my students. I mean, I've been talking to this guy, Max, on Instagram for like two years. He would just randomly, randomly message me and I'd always message him back, right? And we develop a friendship through the internet. And, you know, now here he is winning $240,000 off of a $500 buy-in. That's, that makes me feel good. So anyway, we're going to be here for a long time. I have a great group of pros here to help you. Like I see, they're all consistently making content for poker coaching and poker coaching premium. And, um, I have a big team of um, employees who also help out, who take care of all of the back-end stuff. So, I mean, this, this is a big operation. It's not just me sitting in my little office here uh, making work for all of you. This is a big team working together to help you be the best poker players you can be. We also have a, we'll call it a light version, Poker Co Coaching Standard, which does not give you full access to the entire site. But if you're going to study poker a few hours a week, it is more than sufficient to helping you improve your poker skills we're having a sale, monthly price, $25 a month, no commitment, cancel at any time. Typically what happens is people get in Poker Coaching Standard and love it. They start studying, they start winning more at poker, and then they become a premium member because it makes a whole lot of sense. This is the most affordable way to work on your game every day though and take your skills to the next level because there is tons of content available for you. So make sure you check it out. Look, at the end of the day, you gotta realize I've created Poker Coaching Premium to give you all of the tools that you could ever need to achieve your full poker playing potential. And if I ever fail to deliver on that, if you do not like my, the site, if you're not learning, if you're not enjoying it, I do not want or deserve your money. If you're not completely satisfied with poker coaching, send me an email, support at pokercoaching.com and let my team know within 30 days of when you sign up and I'll give you a full 100% refund. We don't actually have to give a lot of refunds because almost no one requests it. But we do give a refund every, um, you know, every once in a while. And I don't mind. If I do not help you improve your poker skills, I do not deserve your money. Okay? Simple as that. Check it out. PokerCoaching.com slash Halloween. Get in there right now. Am I having a sale on poker coaching anytime soon? Yeah. PokerCoaching.com slash Halloween. I hear we're having a webinar starting soon. Is that correct? Is today October 26th? All right. Online cash game play and explain with Brad Wilson. All right, sweet. Starts in 14 minutes. I guess I better get off this channel, huh? Um, Brad Wilson, very, very strong cash game player. He's going to be streaming live cash games starting very, very soon privately, just for the members. Cool, good. 
I'm actually a pretty big fan of member only streams because they allow the coach to actually coach compared to play and moderate a whole lot of chat, right? Also, they're not really focused on entertainment so much. They entertain some, but they're focused on teaching you to be the best poker player you can be, which I think is very, very valuable. I mean, I'll tell you, I've learned a ton from watching the various players do um, live streaming. How long has this site been around? Ooh, something like three years, this iteration of it, before I had a different site called Float to Turn that focused pretty much only on No Limit Hold'em tournaments. It was mostly just me and a few other people, but we have ramped up the operations full-time, and um, I'm happy that it's here. I'm glad you all are enjoying poker coaching, by the way. I appreciate it. If you enjoy it, click like, click subscribe if you have not already. <sighs> I got to get out of the way for Brad Wilson. He's going to be streaming live cash games soon. So make, well, online cash games live <laughs> soon. Am I playing the World Series main event? Yes. I actually sold like 10% of a few tournaments I'm going to be playing on pocketfives.com. They have a staking site there that charges no rake. I've actually been adamantly against the various staking sites for a long time because... They all charge like five or ten percent. Well, they all—all all of them before Pocket Fives charges five or ten percent, which makes it very unprofitable for you to be buying action. Also, a lot of people who are selling action were selling at big markups, but they got a few people who were happy to sell, you know, five or ten or twenty percent of their action to various tournaments. Um, myself, Dale Negranu, and Felipe Ramos. We're, we all try to, you know, help the community. We're all out there trying to be good ambassadors for the game, and we're all selling small pieces of ourselves for no markup. There's no rake for the site. It is, you know, it's, it's about as reasonable as a, as a spot as it can be. You still have to pay World Series of Poker rake, but no rake to Pocket Fives, no rake to me, even money. I capped the main event action at $10 per person at the most. So just little sweats, right? I sold various sum um, action to, I think, other 10Ks and uh, $1,500 tournaments. No markup. You could only buy $10, though. But there is one tournament. If you want, want some more action, I think the, it's the only one that has not completely sold out. It's for a $100,000 tournament. I think we sold 60% of the action. I was going to sell 70%. Play it like a 30K on my end. And, um, you know, check it out. You want a bit of a sweat? I'm not going to lie. That's the one we have the least amount of edge in. 100Ks are tough. So, if you want to gamble, you can have a good gamble. Buy any amount you want. No markup. Check it out at pocketfives.com. When shall we bet the turn in dead cash games? What's a dead cash game mean? Again, you have to make sure you want to understand what your opponents do incorrectly. I'm going to make the assumption that a dead cash game is a tight cash game, a game where people do not stick around on the flop very often without something that's very good. If you think your opponents are going to fold a lot on the flop, but when they do call on the flop, they have a really, really good hand, then don't bluff all that often and just value it with hands that beat their value range, right? We took all of that from the word... Dead cash game. From the, what, adjective dead. That could be wrong assumption. Who knows, though? But you see what I mean, right? Like, you always want to ask, what do my opponents do that is obviously incorrect? And if you know that, poker becomes not such a difficult game. Say your opponents call the flop really wide, call the turn really wide, and then fold the river a lot. Well, take a second. Think about it. You bet the flop normally maybe a little bluff heavy, bet the turn normally, maybe a little bluff heavy, then you blast the river and they fold almost every time. So many people in small stakes cash games like to cry and complain about how their opponents are calling stations and they can't do anything about it. You got to make hands. And um, it's not true. Most people are not going to put all their money in on the river with king high or queen high or bottom pair or middle pair or top pair bad kicker, right? It's important to realize that. So blast them. When do I arrive for the World Series? I arrive in November, early in November. I don't even know. We are doing breakfast for the poker coaching members. Those are those. Um, we sent out an email to poker coaching members a, a week or two ago. Those are already full. Sorry if you're not in there. But if you're there, make sure you say hello. We're going to have breakfast that morning. I'm buying, doing breakfast two different days. We'll have 25 or so members there. We'll buy them all breakfast. We'll have a good time. It'll be good. How do you buy action on Pocket Fives? You go to pocketfives.com and there's a staking tab right at the top. Let's see. I'll show you. Let's see. Give me just a second. Pull up your website browser. Yeah. Here's pocketfives.com. Look at those beautiful humans there. Click on staking. You have to be logged in. Then you can filter by player. Here's Jonathan Little right at the top. Click apply. Ooh, Josh Arie was selling action. He's actually 
managing this whole operation to some extent. I don't know if he sold action for the event he wanted, but he won a bracelet the other day. Congrats to him. Anyway, as you can see here, here's some of my various action. Unfortunately, sold out, sold out, sold out, sold out. Here is uh, the one left at the bottom, selling 70% of the 100K. But as you see, we were also sold, you know, 10% of the 50K, 10% of a 10K, 10% of a 1500, 10% of a, the main event. A lot of people got 10% of my main event. $10 at a time. So 100 people out there got 0.1% of my main event. I'm happy to do it. Happy to let all of you get a bit of a sweat. Steak and lobster breakfast on Jonathan. Yeah. The nice thing is that we go to this place uh, in, in the Rio and I'm always surprised at how cheap it is. <laughs> like I'll buy 20 people breakfast and it's like 500 bucks. I'm like, okay, fine. Sweet. Louis Philippe said, the one with uh, in Montreal with Mike Sexton was absolutely amazing. Yeah, that was, a, that was a highlight of my life. I was in Montreal playing poker tournaments. Every time I go to a live poker series, I try to buy all the students breakfast or lunch or dinner or whatever I can do, right? We had a meetup. Louis Philippe was there with some of his friends. And um, I talked to Mike Sexton the day before. And he said, yeah, maybe I'll come by. Then here comes then Mike Sexton, right? Right on time. And it was a lot of fun. He's no longer with us. He has a good book called Life's a Gamble. Where is it? For those who don't know, to some extent, I helped curate all the content for DNB Poker, this publisher. And I got Mike Sexton to write his autobiography just in time. He's no longer with us, but great book. He has an audiobook version of it. He reads it. Check it out. I think you can get it at jlpoker.com slash sexton. So check that out. <sighs> All right, that's going to be it for today. If you enjoyed this webinar, check out pokercoaching.com slash Halloween. I work at least reasonably hard, <laughs> to make all of you all of the content you could possibly need to crush poker. Many of the students are crushing poker. They're working hard. They're improving their skills, and they are improving their lives, and I want that for all of you, too. That's me for today. Good luck in the games. Have fun. If you're a poker coaching member, make sure you check out the Brad Wilson live stream that's happening in eight minutes. There's a link to it in the dashboard on pokercoaching.com. Thanks for being here. Enjoy yourselves. Have a great, great week, and I'll talk to you next time.